We had four stages the first year, right? So we had Mambo, we had Main Stage, we had a sort of techno, we had a hip hop stage. So I was telling Lincoln, we're gonna do this. He goes, okay, fine, let's let's do it and everything. Then I remember I came up with this name, Zook Out and About. And Lincoln goes, let's just call it Zook Out. I remember we printed 9,000 advance tickets, 2,000 door tickets, 1,000 comp tickets. All that had gone out. I remember we had to start selling the door tickets in advance because by right, the door tickets you should only sell on the night. More expensive. The price, more expensive, right? Yeah. But we ran out the ninth of, of the 9,000 advance. Let's just sell the door tickets are? I said, yeah. what, what price? The door price? I said, oh, okay, all right, okay. <laughs> we recently spoke, spoke to uh, Lincoln and mm. uh, you share a great number of years with him as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so maybe we can like kind of recount that like, you know, I've, I've uh, spoken to Lincoln and then he said that, you know, Zook was like first three years not profitable, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and it's so difficult to like create something so revolutionary, like a product that's so revolutionary. So how did you all finally break even? Is it finally you convinced the people or something like that? Well, yeah, I think that, that's exactly what happened. Um, I remember when I first came to Singapore, uh, when I moved here for, for Zook, and Lincoln would tell me that Saturday night was our best night of the week. You know, we get 1,200 people. Friday night, not bad, maybe half of that. Uh, then we started this Wednesday night called Mambo Jambo that was starting to pick up a lot. Right. So this is in 93, July 93, right? So mm. I said, okay, you know, 1,200 people on a Saturday, that's, that's pretty good, right? Um, mm. But as time went on, uh, our Friday started to drop and it dropped really badly, actually. Friday? Um, yeah. Mm. And it got to the stage where we had only 300 people on a Friday night on the dance floor. This oh. is in 1993. So Lincoln said, let's start a new night. Let's come up with a theme for the night. Because Friday and Saturday in the United States was not, never branded. It was, never, it, was never, it was just Friday night, Saturday night, right? And you know, usually resident DJs, and you have guest DJs coming, you know, every every now and again. Um, it was a very different model in those days. They would usually play. The guest DJs would fly over. Uh, they didn't charge to play, but they would we basically pay for their holiday to Asia. So they yeah. play Friday, Saturday, and then Lincoln would take them to Bali for the week, mm. and then they come back for the next Friday and Saturday. So they played they played four nights mm. over two weeks. Um, didn't charge a fee, but we would cover the you know, expenses. So. So that was happening from 91 to 93. Um, uh, sorry, even longer actually, uh, and that model. So when I joined, uh, Lincoln said, yeah, let's start a theme night on Friday. And he wanted to go back to the roots of Zook, which was Balearic. Mm. Uh, so by 93 already, trance and progressive was coming in. It was already getting, music was getting a little bit harder. Mm. Uh, it had already evolved from what was in 91 mm. from the Balearic, uh, the house stuff that that Lincoln had really studied and really want Zook to be. Mm. So we, we launched a night called Balearic on, on Friday nights. Um, and we started to do a, a few more events during those nights. And uh, over time, we started to book more guest DJs only for Friday night. Mm. All right. And so the model evolved whereby DJs would fly out and um, we pay them a fee. Uh, it was no longer the holiday thing was no longer a, the Bali thing was no longer a part of the package, you know. They, and they would play in other cities in Asia, right? So we're starting this whole circuit around Asia. Right. So fast forward, uh, suddenly Friday was the new Saturday, and Friday night was the biggest night of the week. Whoa! Uh, and that was unheard of back back in those days, right? It was always Saturday was the big night, Friday was the quiet night. What was the Saturday programming? Um, just resident DJs, mm. right? Um, playing what? Playing house progressive. Trance, techno, probably less techno at that time, but it's more, more house, progressive. So Friday trance. is the special, specialized Balearic. Yeah, well, he, he wanted us to do more Balearic. But having said that though, it was basically, Balearic for him was no, wasn't just about that style from Ibiza, but it's also about being open-minded with music and being a bit more Okay, if you enjoyed the podcast so far, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. You'll definitely help us get discovered more. And now back to the show. Commercial, I don't want to say that. I shouldn't use the commercial, a bit more friendlier, more vocal, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. more like that. And um, that was Friday nights. And suddenly, you know, maybe a couple of years after that, Friday became the, bi the, the biggest night of the week, right? Yeah. Um, of course, the other biggest night of the week was Wednesday. Yeah. So when I first came to Singapore in '93, Tuesday night was ladies' night at Shinwazari yeah. at, at the Hyatt. Uh, that was the big night, Tuesday night, ladies' night, right? Tuesday Wednesday night, ladies. yeah, yeah, oh Wednesday night was dead everywhere, yeah, but. Zook started this thing called Mambo Jambo and, uh, and things again over time, suddenly Wednesday was the big night. 
Oh. So one thing I was very proud of, and I think you know, for, the, for not just you know, it was the whole uh, the whole team effort was that mm. we took we changed the way Singaporeans were partying in in Singapore. So it was yeah. used to be Tuesday for ladies' night, Saturday that were the two nights. Yeah. Now it was Wednesday and Friday. Mm. Um, so the money, yeah, started to come in. Um, I think another thing that we did was the advent of foreign DJs coming out and it became a profitable uh, venture to have book DJs. Mm. Um, people didn't understand that at the time. Why are you booking these foreign DJs? They play for one night. How do you make money back and everything? I said, because the whole media, the whole industry behind them was starting to pick up. Mm. And business-wise, it made a lot of sense. We made and we did well during those days. Those early, you know, first, uh, let's say, up to the millennial, uh, up to two, year two thousand. The, the fees were reasonable, and you could make money out of it. And um, and people would drink, pay cover charge. We have guests this, but it was fine. It, we, we were it was it was doing well. So by that time, that's when things started becoming profitable because we found that opportunity. Um, I think the other one was Velvet. We started. Um, we had this night called Air Crew Night that was on Tuesday and Thursday. Air Crew only in Velvet? I thought it's like a venue. Like yeah, global. but we, we, we did a special theme night to, right. to be very, how do I say, we, we were targeting Air Crew specifically. And they actually felt privileged. They used to tell me, oh, we really appreciate this because you're, you guys are really taking care of us. And we've told everyone in SQ and all our friends and other foreign airlines to come down on Tuesday and Thursday. So Damn. that started to snowball and then that became a big thing. So. If you look at those sort of decisions that we made, that's how we started to make money. But it was, yeah, it wasn't easy the first few years. But more importantly is what, what Lincoln said, and I think he said it in his interview was, you have to have patience. Yeah. You have to believe in what you're doing and you have to, uh, yeah, you just got to stay, stay focused on your, your vision, your purpose, and, and hopefully, you know, um, be able to see it through and then bring it up to the way you, it should be, right? So it took time. There's no doubt about it. We, you know, we spent a lot of time doing it, but, you know. Um, but yeah. then when you were there, then you see like every year that it's not making money. You know, do, do you have like that fear like, oh my God, what's happening, you know? So I joined in 93 yeah. and uh, I think, okay, 93, 94 was good. Then 95 with the drug bust. So that sort of reset Oh my God. Everything went backwards there, right? Um, and we reopened at the end of 95. Mm -hmm. um, 96 was starting to pick up really mm -hmm. well. I think what was interesting about Zook was that um, pre-drug bus, Zook was seen as, a some, as something, right? Something a bit more underground. But once drug bus had happened and we had reopened, Zook had sort of crossed into the mainstream a little bit and we attracted a wider audience. So 96 was already starting to look good. Okay. And uh, then we did a lot of other things in, in 97, 98 that were really interesting. And we started to do a lot of stuff. I mean, 90, 96, I mean, uh, we had Bjork playing two shows in Zook in the main floor, right? We had mm. 97, we had Chemical Brothers, Massive Attack, Eurasia. Um, so during this whole period, we're doing all these things that suddenly Zook was no longer this underground club. Yeah. That was, it was, it was becoming more mainstream, but in a, in a cool way, right? It was still doing things that, when you say mainstream, well, you know, Bjork's not mainstream, right? Chemical Brothers is not mainstream, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it was more mainstream than what we were previously doing, right? So, yeah. um, so over time, yeah, we just, just kept patient, being patient, kept doing it, just keep doing it, keep doing it. And, you know, that's how things picked up. And I remember when I left, uh, when I, re I left Zook in March 2001, that was when I resigned. And, and um, I would say the last year I was there was our best revenue of the time. So things are just, I always see this as a pattern, right? When you first open, things are doing really well mm. and things will drop a bit Yeah. after the hype is over. Yeah. And then you just got to bring it up, but it takes a little bit longer. Yeah. And then just eventually, either you go, all the way, or yeah. you, you take your time and you move, build it up, and it can be ten years, twenty years, and look at Zook now. It's what thirty-five years doing that. So yeah. So back in the day, you have a lot of like free reign to do cool stuff because Lincoln is like a huge supporter of like yeah cool no, stuff. No, 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 no. I appreciated him a lot. I mean, he really <laughs> gave me carte blanche. Um, I was very appreciative of that. 
Um, obviously, I had to prove myself to him in the early days. And um, as time went on, he, he gave me more free reign and, you know, me, let me, you know, uh, get on with it, you know, and not, not, not have to, you know, um, you know not, not be tied down by red tape, uh, right. at least from management, you know what I mean? It was, if any red tape was usually the government stuff, right? But yeah, red tape from him was never there. So I, I really appreciate that. It was, it was able to give me that opportunity to, you know, do things that, I, I could never have dreamt, dreamt of at that age of my life, yeah. Yeah, because now if you look at all the, most of the clubs now in the scene, uh, they are like fighting each other, see who can be more commercial, <laughs> so that they can suck the crowd over, you know. So, I honestly don't think that is the way. Yeah, it will kind of like uh, degrade the scene in a sense. Uh. So, maybe you have any advice on like, how like, the club <laughs> should like, position themselves <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh that's a hard one to answer i don't really yeah. go clubbing anymore um, yeah but is it like the you know they had to do cool stuff and eventually your tribe will find you something like that that's that was my belief back in those days um do you think it still applies now or is it way harder now i would say it's way harder now but because everything is done and done before you know? yes and no mm. um i think uh I think people have to um, appreciate that things do go full circle, you know. Oh, the music, train will come back. Music goes full circle. Yeah. Um, I think one of the questions you were asking me was one of the things that surprised me, right? And, and yeah. What surprised me, to be very honest, was when EDM conquered Zook, right? Mm. Um, that really surprised me. I never thought Zook would, would uh, go down that route. Um, having been there with House, techno, trance, progressive, um, to then follow that route of EDM and that big, you know, festival sound that was very commercial and uh, that surprised me, that shocked me actually. Um, mm -hmm. But having said that though, I can't, I can't comment on that because I wasn't there at the time. And maybe if I was in that job at the time, I would have done the same thing. But I don't know because I wasn't there, right? So, um, and I'm sure Lincoln resisted as much as he could. I'm sure he did not want to go down that route, but he had no choice but to follow what was happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that, that kind of shocked me as well. So for me, it's like, can the, can the philosophies or the strategies of that era work now? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in those days, we didn't have social media, we didn't have internet, we didn't have TikTok and things like that. We, 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 were, we did flyers that were printed every week and we had to sit there and, and, and put, label them every week and send out the 10,000 flyers every week. We had to, there was no email, no internet, you know. I think internet just started around that time I was there. Um, there, was, there was no Facebook, no social media, no, none of that, right? I mean, those days, I banned photography in Zook, right? I, I just did, I just not allow photography. You couldn't bring a camera into Zook. It's like an Ibiza style club where there's no camera. No, I, I refuse to allow cameras in. People are like, yeah. oh, I can't bring a camera in. I said, because there's people here who not who are with people they're not supposed to be with. Oh. So that's why. <laughs> so let's protect the privacy. You know? Let's flip. <laughs> Last thing you want is, uh, you know. What stays in Jakim? Yeah, what damn well. Jakim. That's the way it is. You should always protect privacy of your, of your guests, right? Because it's just the way it is. It's the scene that we have and it's hedonistic yeah sure and so that's why you have to protect it yeah so. mm. yeah but now it's a little bit more glitz and glamour kind of like superficial no there were aspects of that back in back in our days uh, there was glitz and glamour there was definitely superficialism there was a, a little of that there wasn't i wouldn't say there wasn't any but um yeah but now it's quite different because uh uh the, the channel of distribution of your content is much different in those days there was no channel of content distribution right there's like yeah. you couldn't take photographs um the official photographer would come and take some photos and you, you look for a magazine and say hey where's my photo where's my photo you know oh that, my that, God. that's yeah. about it and, I remember that's, and that'll be like a year a month sorry a month later you find your photograph yeah hey, now it's instant, juice magazine yeah yeah exactly and now it's instant, instant gratification right so so it's a different time so would what work then? Would it work now? I don't know. Yeah. So um, another question that I have for you is, so you have like seen so many cycles that happen from your time at Zoo. Uh, eventually, we will talk a little bit about Powerhouse, Lo and Behold, and now the OUE group. So what has been one thing that uh, remained constant within the nightlife and F&B realm? 
It's always about understanding your guests and your target audience and really knowing what they want and maybe knowing what they don't know they're going to like yet. Ooh, if, yeah, if you correct. can do that, you, you've done it well. But yeah. it's always about the guest experience. And I think in the, maybe the last, for me personally, in the last 10, 12 years, or more importantly is your employees, what their experience is like, making sure they're happy working for you. Wow. Um, I think that's really important because if, you're, if your staff are happy, then hopefully they'll take care of the customers and the customers will be happy, right? So um, I think that's something that uh, I've really uh, took on in the last maybe 15 years of my career. So, Especially in the customer service realm, right? Mm. Imagine your staff are having a bad day. Where do they have the mood to, hey, yeah. how are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's not easy, not easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Would you say like American companies have better perks than typical Asian companies? Yes and no. Yes and yeah. no. Um, I think it's different. I think it's all about um, how you define perks, are, you know. Mm. Uh, some people think it's uh, foosball tables and free coffee in the pantry, you know. It's, that's not that's not really it, like, you know. It's it's like I said, it's all all boils down to and actually, I think the same with the guest experience, knowing what your customers want, knowing what your staff want. So empathy, empathy is the mm. key. Understanding, you know, if people don't play foosball in your office, then it's a waste of time. It's not a benefit, right? It's not a perk, yeah. right? So yeah. it's really about knowing what your, your people want. And same with your guests who come mm. to your restaurants or your bars or your clubs. What do they want? What are they looking for? Mm. What, what is it that excites them? And what gets them to come back again? What gets them to become regular? And then you just have to address that, you know? Mm -hmm. And then uh, what would you say are some changes in the scene that surprise you? Well, like I said, uh, EDM conquering Zoot was a big one. <laughs> that was, but like I said, a lot of things come full cycle. I mean, um, musically, I think house, techno, trance, progressive is all coming back. Mm. Um, even when it comes to things like cocktails, I remember when I was growing up, you know, uh, my sister, my, my dad would come home from work and my sister would make him a gin and tonic, you yeah. know, with a Schweppes tonic and probably something like Gordon's gin, I think, in those days. Mm. And then fast forward 20 years, Hendrix comes along and gin tonics are back again. Yeah. So, you know, cocktail, class, old classic cocktails like Negroni's, Old Fashions, they all, everything comes back. Everything, so it's all about cycles and, yeah. and, and, and understanding cycles and, and so... That doesn't, actually doesn't surprise me because it has, has proven itself over time. Fashion, the same fashion, what you wear, the clothes in the 80s were inspired by the clothes from the 50s. And then what people are wearing now is inspired by the 80s. It's all cyclical, right? So, right. so a lot of those things don't surprise you. But um, So in a way, you can kind of predict what's next if you know what's before. Yes and no. I don't, I don't want to be so bold to say that. Mm. I think, um, yeah, I think there's other outside forces that influence how how those things are uh, consumed by the, by, the, by the people. Yeah, because just now you mentioned something, right, that I find I say it myself quite a lot also. Sometimes, right, um, you need to let your audience trust you that you know them better than ah, they know okay. themselves. That's a, that's a great one. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, no, no, that was something that I was blessed, um, very blessed uh, during my time at Zook, especially the last couple of years mm. where... I felt that I could, um, and it's not to sound arrogant on it, but I was able to book any DJ that I personally liked and they may not be known to anyone in the club, but they trusted us that... They're well, going to have a good time. Yeah, because the, yeah. the people that are doing putting on this show are the Zoot people and they know what they're doing. So yeah. just trust them, you know, and I was very blessed because I, I had nights where I was surprised that people actually came for certain things that uh, I would never have dreamt of ever achieving, you know, in a, in a regular club. Um, but the people trusted us. And, and, you know, I mentioned just now about, you know, that time in 97, we had massive attack, Kimmel Brothers, Eurasia, we had Bjork the year before. And even, yeah, 96, I remember I was, I was doing things like Snowboy in the Latin section. I was doing uh, Ronnie Jordan, Galliano, the sort of acid jazz scene and um, you know we had Primal Screen, we had Ash, Placebo, all these bands playing and people were like but these bands are not like house 
access in the end. We're not, we're not about that. We are about... Breaking boundaries. Yeah, culture. It's about popular culture. We want people to... You know, I remember uh, this... this um, I, you, know, you know the saxophone is K, right? Yeah, yeah, K, yeah. So I don't know if you know this, but he, he's, his background is in jazz, right? Yeah. And the first time he played for me at Zook, he was 16, 17. He was in a band called Stigmata uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a sort of an indie uh, rock guitarist who's from Oddfellows, Kelvin Tan. And another guy, Ian Goh, who's a quite well-known artist now, but he was doing bass. So Kay was doing his sax, guitar was, was Kelvin, and Ian was doing double bass. Yeah. And it was basically improvised jazz. Yeah. Like, it was like one hour of, it just went non-stop. They just went... Freestyle. Yeah, all the way. It right. just had, there was no start or finish. I mean, yeah. start, yes, and finish, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, one hour later. And, and I actually saw Ian recently. He actually thanked me for the opportunity. I, I said, yeah, because you, yeah, there weren't that many people in the room, but we were really happy that you gave us a chance to play in such a beautiful space and with a sound system. And I said, yeah, because to me, that was important. It's like, you know, trying to do things that open people's minds to different experiences and, you know, hopefully leads to other things, you know. Yeah. Keep um, it fresh. You thought it's always the same thing. Yeah. yeah. There's only so many trance DJs you can book, yeah. right? And, and so that's why we kept pushing boundaries. I mean, we, we did drum and bass. I mean... But where did this improvised jazz thing, was it, was it at Wine Bar or Velvet or something? It was in Zoo. Zook main room. Yeah, yeah, early hours. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I know um, Jeremy Boone put K for like an improvised saxophone se session for early hours in Capital at Zook Clarky as well. So yeah. it's like kind of like bring back a little bit of the yeah, back then. Yeah, I, I mean, it's about yeah. just trying new things and just, um, you know, yeah, I don't know. For me, and, and it, maybe this is my upbringing as well, because growing up in Sydney and I was very influenced by. New York scene and London scene in Sydney and and it, it was different styles of music it was fashion it was art there was all sorts of things that were part of the, the club scene it wasn't like just DJs playing for themselves it was visuals it was you know fashion art a uh, whole bunch of things so and musically if you could do things like jazz mm. why not you know because it's you know uh, and you know, I, I always wanted to do blues in Zook, but I could never get a blues artist to play for me. You know, I I love blues, but and you think about it, oh, you know, house the influence of house comes from where? Oh, there's jazz, there's blues. You know, there's a whole bunch of things. So mm. it's all the roots. It, everyone influences each other, right? So that's how it is. So why not, you know, just try things? Yeah. It doesn't always work. Yeah. I remember the first time I, I brought Placebo to Singapore. We only had 300 people turning up, um, and they just released that single off. off it was, it was big, it was, I think it was the third album came out, and and I asked I asked the you know, radio station guys because I wasn't a fan of their music at the time yet, and then I said, "Hey, I got this band Placebo. What do you think? Oh, here, bring them out. They're really, they're really the hottest thing, hottest thing." <laughs> I could only sell 300 tickets, all right. Um, of course, years later is another story, but the point is that. Um, I, I had to try it. I had to try it. I wanted to see if the crowd could handle it. And, uh, we still had a great night. We still, we still had enough people to make the, you know, the, the, the concert work. But, you know, it was just about having... Um, you haven't reached the masses yet. Yeah. yeah but we, we also have to be very careful how we plan budgets and everything. And how do, you, how do you make the numbers work? Even when you don't sell that many tickets, how do you make the numbers work, right? So yeah. it's, it's about being smart about that as well. So, yeah. Right. So um, is there like a inherent risk in being so forward? Uh, do you all sometimes like dial it, dial it down a notch just to like make ends meet? Of course, of course. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think it was always important um, to balance things. And um, yeah, so, so it was... We we had to book in those days. We had to book DJs that were, the what the begin the ones that we knew would sell a lot of tickets, yes. right? Yes. And um, be a bit more friendlier. Fantastic. Mm. Then we'll balance that with things that we know will be a bit more experimental, and we may not make as much money. But you had to look at things in totality, right? Right. So if you only look at just that one night versus that one night, that night will the good night will trump the bad night. 
But if you were to combine it all together and look at it in totality, maybe for, maybe for the week or for a month, it doesn't look so bad then. Oh, right, right. It's, it's, it's the lens you look at because what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a narrative of what, you're trying to create that scene, you're trying to have different things going. Now, of course, if you can go for every act is a, is a big winner, Yeah. Yeah, then you, you can yeah just treat it as one night thing and whatever like you can but what do you gain out of that yeah yeah, yeah. very and, very stale your lineup yeah it will be very then, safe it will be, yeah very safe and very obvious and, and it doesn't help right so yeah. I think it was always about mixing things up and um, I remember I did get self-indulgent a lot like, I mean in the <laughs> booking I remember my last weekend when I was working at Zook and I didn't plan it this way it just happened to be my last weekend but on the Friday night I had Joe Clausell from Body and Soul playing, and Saturday night I had Jeff Mills playing, mm. and people go like, "Did you plan this?" I said, "No, from I didn't." Back to I, back, man. Yeah, it was like, yeah, Friday night was Joe, and Saturday night was Jeff. I was like, yeah, I didn't, but I thought, wow, that's uh, that's quite amazing, and um, and a lot of people, would, when I talk internationally to promoters and people, they they would never dare see those sort, two sort of DJs in the same club on a different date. They wouldn't. They would, because in, those, in other countries, the identity is a lot clearer, right? It's right, like, right. this is it, this is it. There's no, you know, promoters are very focused on one, one genre. One, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas in Zoot, because we own the club, we can do what we want. We, we are very fortunate. That's why I was very appreciative of what Lincoln, the platform Lincoln gave me to, to mm. do what I could do, yeah, and enjoy it, you know, so, yeah. Insane. So maybe we can move on to uh, Zook Out. So, uh, oh, Zook yeah. Out, yes. So, um, do you recount the most significant difficulty that you face when you create Zuka. Because l- l- I think you create Zuka is definitely... Well, no, no, let, let, let me give you the whole backstory of Zuka. Um, okay. So I remember it was January of 2000 and uh, Cher, as in DJ Cher, was, yeah. and he had left Zuka already. Yeah. He was doing his own promoting and he, him and I were sitting in the Zuka wine bar having a, having a coffee, whatever. And he goes to me, Andrew, I want to do all night party festival in Sentosa. I said, oh, really? Yeah, Sentosa can get a 6 a.m. license. I said, oh, really? <laughs> this is in 2000, right? This is in 2000. I said, oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. And then I said to him, why don't we do it together? Why don't Zook and you do it together? So, okay. He goes, really? I said, yeah. Then he goes, okay, I've got a name for it. It's going to be called the Ordea or something like that. Oh, dear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I said, I said oh, okay, all right. Then I said to him, and, was, and I remember the, the stages of us negotiating and adding things to it so that we would guarantee it to be a successful night, right? Because we weren't sure if it would work because no one had done it before, right? Yeah. So first thing I said to Cho, you need to put the Zook name into the name of the event. He goes, no, 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 cannot, cannot. We, we, we're going to do 50-50, we cannot. I, mean, I, said, I, said, I, said, I said, mate, come on. It's going to sell you more tickets. He goes, yeah, okay, fair enough. Okay, fine, fine. So he agreed, he agreed to that, right? And then um, we, we, so I booked, I remember I booked Dave Seaman, right? And Dave Seaman was playing for Renaissance last time. And he would, in Renaissance, we'd do 3,000 tickets, right, at Zook. And Jack So I thought, okay, that could be, if I can book him and I can sell 3,000 tickets, that's the starting point for me, right? So here's my headliner, booked him 3,000, okay, fine. And then wh- whichever other DJs you add on will just add more to that 3,000. You, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, get yeah. to 5,000, 6,000. That's how you do it, right? The whole lineup. Yeah. So then we said, oh, maybe we should put a mambo jambo tent in there. <laughs> and that will get the other crowd to come. So yeah. that again will increase the number of tickets Wait, being so sold. Second stage. Yeah. Or, or same. Second stage, second stage. Oh. We had four stages the first year, right? What them? Um, four stages. Yeah. What's, the, what's the four stage? Main so we stage? had Mambo, we had main stage, we had a sort of techno, uh, techno stage, and Local. we had a we had a hip hop stage. Oh, yeah. So, and then the last one was, okay. So so I was telling Lincoln we're going to do this. He goes, okay, fine, let's let's do it and everything. And um, he goes, okay, the Velvet Crowd aren't going to come for Zuka. D- don't worry about them. We'll, we'll keep Velvet and Wine Bar open. Yeah. And we'll close Zook in future. And, you know, I said, hmm, okay. Then as we got closer to the date, Lincoln goes, okay, we're going to close Velvet as well. I go, why, <laughs> why? Because all the Velvet people want to go to Zook out. I said, okay, there you go. Right. <laughs> so when you ha- add those layers in, suddenly you're going to have a bigger audience, right? Yeah. 
Um, I mean, back then when I was still at Jakim final year, we we can't realistically open anything because we had to move all the DJ equipment, everything out. Hmm. So we can't even open anything, right? Yeah, it's like not logistically feasible as well. As well. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. Our equipment was not from all Jakim. outsourced back then. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, so right, I don't right, know right, what right. it's like last few years, but <laughs> right, we outsource everything. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so and then the other thing was. Um, Ah, the name of Zucat was interesting. Uh, actually, Lincoln was the one that came up with the name. Um, I remember we were... The all day I didn't really work as a name. And then, then I remember I was very inspired by, in Australia, Big Day Out. And the vibes on the summer's day was another festival in Sydney. Um, so I came up with this name, Zook Out and About. Yeah. Zook Out and About, right? Yeah. And then I remember talking to Lincoln, that, that, that was my proposal for the name. Lincoln goes... Let's just call it Zook Out. I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, I like that. Yeah, I that like was that. a legendary moment. Yeah. Huh? yeah. And then, yeah. then I said to him, okay, by the way, the logo cannot be the Zook logo with the word out next to it. All right. We're going to have to create a new logo because that's branding. You cannot, <laughs> you cannot use the bloody, that, 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 that sort of uh, Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah. You can't use that logo and add the word out to it. And that's your logo for Zook Out. No, no, no. Let's create a new brand, a new identity because it's a new property, right? So he agrees to that as well because I was surprised because you, you always try to like squeeze things to the original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said to him, no, you've got you to evolve. You've got to evolve. But yeah, 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 yeah. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. But in terms of challenges, no. I mean, uh, we we're very blessed. The first year we had very good sponsorship. Uh, Sentosa was amazing as a partner. Um, I think what was really interesting was the fact that at the time, not many Singaporeans had traveled to festivals. It was yeah. still pretty new. No, no budget airlines. Yeah. You know. I, I was, of course, you know, working in the industry, I was blessed to have gone to Fuji Rock Festival many times before then. I've been to Miami. I've been to. Uh, I went to the very first Ultra in '99. Whoa. I went to festivals in Australia. I went to uh, Love Parade in Berlin in '99 as well. I went to Trans Music Cow in France. And so I was very fortunate to have gone to these festivals and sort of under sort of. And when I went, I went as as a, as a fan, right? And I right. went, and, but I would be taking notes of you know how they run festivals, like oh, well, separate the. The paper, the water, and the glass from each other, the, the, the waste, right? And right, then right. To, to, port to lose will be there, security will be done this way, and all, all these sort of interesting things. I'll just take notes, just, you know, why not, you know, take yeah. notes on. And then coming back and realizing, I'm going to use these notes now to create a festival called Zuka, right? So that was really good. But I think that, that was the sort of difficult, I wouldn't say difficult, challenging thing was a lot of people hadn't been to festivals before, so they didn't know what to expect. Yeah. You know, they're usually used to go into a club night for three hours. Yeah. 12 hours? What? What? 12 hours so long? I don't think I can handle that. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> a festival is you go, you, you, you dance here for a bit, you go have a drink here, you go have a rest here, you can lie down for a bit on the beach, you know, yeah. you know, you just, it's, it's, like it's you, multi, you you multi, it's a multi, yeah, you know, entertainment, right? It's not like you're going to Velvet on a Friday night for two hours and that's your night out, right? It's not that, right? So it was just, that part was, uh, I wouldn't say it's a challenge, but something that people weren't, used to yet. Right? But how so, many people is the first one? Okay, the last few years, all the media kept saying 9,000, but that, that's not correct. I remember we printed, in those days, we print tickets, right? Mm. So I remember printed 9,000 advance tickets, 2,000 door tickets, and 1,000 comp tickets. Okay. And so that's, what, 12,000? Yeah, so all that had gone out. Right? Whoa. Yeah. I remember we had to start selling the, <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't do this, but we started selling the door tickets in advance because by right, the door tickets should only sell on the night. More expensive. Price, more expensive, right? Yeah. Um, but we ran out of the 9,000 9, advance. We ran out. Oh. So Lincoln goes, did I just sell the door tickets? I said, yeah. <laughs> what, what price? The door price? I said, oh, okay, all right, okay. okay. <laughs> advance? Yeah. Well, and people just grab it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so um, amazing that Singaporeans will dive into something that they do not know what to expect. Because that's not something that they do nowadays. If they don't know what to expect, they will like, uh, you know. But what, again, well, back then is. No, we... go, you know, go back to this thing about the trust of the brand, right? Oh. Would, that be, would that be the answer to that? That yeah. people trusted Zook, that Zook. Zook has really created the trust for like at least 10 years before Zook out, right? Yeah, 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. 10 years. So. Yeah, and they never like gave up on the mission halfway, you know. It's like, okay, I believe mm. in like promoting cool stuff and the culture. 
you know and another very interesting story is um uh the story between lincoln and felix so felix has a dance crew and then you know lincoln is just like giving them the space to use i remember that yeah that was so, our first hip-hop jam when i found out that algin was also a, a b-boy yeah. um so no we, we i remember it was um I called it, we called it Fresh. It was yeah. called uh, Hip Hop Jam. And I remember, and Andrew Chow was the one that t- telling me about all this stuff. And so I studied a little bit more about it and I said, let's do this hip hop night. And we do the four pillars, right? Which yep. is meant to be um, graffiti, turntablers, b-boy, and MC. Yep. And we add in one more, which I suppose for outside was the skateboarding, right? Which is not really one, but we have to put in there, right? So. Um, and yeah, and that's what that's how Radical Force came together, yeah. or at least they were together before that. But then we we had them, you know, and then we do that every year. Actually, the first year of Zook Out, we had them. At, we had a, that tent, the hip hop tent, was the mm. Radical Force was there. So we had the b boy thing, we had this graffiti, we had the MCs, we had the DJs. Yeah, we had the same thing. Right. Yeah. So like Andrew Chow, Felix, or they run that tent. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, I guess it's like, you know, if you support the community, somehow they will, you know, they will repay you. They will, they will support you in some way if you're like genuine about it. But right now, every, every man is for himself, you know. They, there's not much of this kind of like community, supporting community. Kind yeah, of it's thing. a different time, right? Different yeah. time. Different time. Different time. A, a little yeah. different. Yeah. So when you spoke about the four pillars of hip hop, right? Something very interesting happened is the DMC World DJ Championships. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Were you were you involved in any? Yeah. So what happened was, um, so the guy that had the franchise for DMC in Singapore and Hong Kong was an old friend of mine, Alan James Jewel, uh, based out of Hong Kong. And before I came to Singapore, I was living in Hong Kong, so I knew Alan. Alan's a good friend and. And uh, he was a guy that used to supply all the DJs with the DMC uh, vinyl. Mm. They had all these different mixes and everything, right? So after I moved to Singapore to join Zook in 93, I remember, I think it was 97, and I saw, I mean, we opened Future in 96. In December 96, we opened Future. And we had Tony and Andrew playing, and Andrew was, you know, he, we started doing hip hop nights because that was his thing. Although Big Beat was what was big for the clubbing audience, but yeah. hip hop was his true passion, right? Yeah. So then I was, saying, I was talking to Alan and I said, hey man, I think it's time to bring back DMC. Whoa. Because DMC had not been around since the 80s. Mm. And uh, the, guy, the last guy that won DMC in Singapore back in the 80s, uh, may he rest in peace, is a guy called Gabriel who. Mm. who was a DJ at Fire, and he uh, his career took off when he moved to Malaysia. He, he moved to KL, but um, and uh, Gabriel was the last DMC champion in Singapore. I think it was eighty eight, maybe. Um, so we decided in ninety eight to bring her back ten years after the last competition. Yeah, and uh, so Alan would come from Hong Kong, and he'd be the judge. Um, yeah, and we would just start it up. And so people like Co Flow, Ruff. Um, who was that? Uh, Jay Styles. Yeah. All these guys were, were. I wouldn't say they were discovered at the contest, but they were there. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah, Kofo yeah, was yeah, a yeah. classic one. Kofo was like, uh, he had a certain style, he had certain arrogance, certain <laughs> look and certain thing. And he was good, I remember. I remember when Kofo won, I think I was, I'd already left Zook. But, and, but they asked me to come back as a judge, and I remember, yeah, Coflow was really, really good. But no, so all these all these kids were like, yeah. growing up and watching DMC videos on VHS tapes, and you know, and and trying to learn how to do all the all the all the tentacleism and everything was was always fun and um, yeah, yeah. So no, no, we yeah we we brought that back, and uh, it's a shame they didn't continue it, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, they con- they continued for about maybe. After I left, maybe three or four years after I left, they continued, but they didn't bring it back after that. Yeah. It's oh, a shame. Yeah. Um, after that, I also kind of like brought back the future DJ battle. Oh, ah, yeah. 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 So cool, it, like, cool. it died for a while. Then yeah. I brought yeah, it we, back. We started that as we, when we started the, the future DJ battle, because we wanted it to use it as a launch pad for DMC. Yeah. As a, I wouldn't call it launch pad, maybe call it boot camp. Mm-mm-mm. Like because, beginner version. Yeah. Well, no, not even that. I wanted them to just 
keep using it as a practice, practice, practice. Oh. Compete, compete, compete. Right, right, right. So when we got to the DMC, yeah. everyone was hardened because yeah. winning Singapore DMC is not the goal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The goal is to go to global, U- right? UK, yeah, yeah. Fight the world championships. So if you can be battling each other week to week in preparation for DMC Singapore, so you can then go overseas. Then that's what it is. It's training. It's it's like yeah. It's like a sport, right? You you got to have the competition to get to where you want to be, right? So it's the yeah. same thing. DMC was a competition. It was a sport, right? It was like, and every week you had battles. You had battles. You had battles. And mm. then and then you know, okay, who's gonna be favorite for DMC? Okay, who's gonna? You know? But that's how we did like it. A qualifier. Right? Yeah, and then you, of course, when you do that. The, the battles, you, you're building up an audience as well who, who are following this. You know, you, you're building aspirations of young kids who are first time watching turntablism and maybe three years later, they're the champion, you know, but you're building, you're building, you're building. And then we get the DMC, everyone's there, right? Yeah. So it, it's just, yeah. Yeah, culture building, man, is so like lacking right now. Everybody's like so um, uh, wary of the dollars and cents that a lot of things that could have happened didn't happen. Yeah, mm. so... Uh, I'm still like very in awe of people that are back in the day that is able to create all this right even without social media you know everything like physical yeah, yeah. I, I guess really there's when there's a will there's a way uh, to create all sorts of like miracles yeah so um, so I think we have already covered a lot about Zook maybe we can uh, move on to your next stage which is oh. St. James Powerhouse because when I first met you the other day right at High House right it was so funny. You were you were telling me that um, you were trying to make Abing cool again. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I had a few drinks when I spoke to you. But anyway, <laughs> what, 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 what I was trying to say was that, um, you know, I left Zook for about four years and I was doing an agency, yep. um, a, a marketing agency. And I realized that that wasn't for me and I wanted to come back to nightlife. Right. And then when Dennis Fu announced that he was doing St. James Power Station, which is a beautiful building. And, um, and actually, to be honest, uh, Lincoln and I had looked at that for, for a Zook, actually, about mm. four or five years earlier, when the, the lease at Jack Kim Street was always having an issue, right? So we're looking for alternative venues. And St. James Power Station at the time was a, I think it was a Keppel warehouse. Mm. And we saw it. I said, my God, this would be amazing, right? But in a way... Jack Kim got renewed, so we didn't have to pursue St. James as a venue, right? Um, but they did some parties there over time, you know, between that period. And when Dennis Fu announced that he was taking on the building, I gave him a call. I said, mate, if you're doing St. James, I'm going to be part of this because it's 70,000 square feet. You can build so many things inside, all right? But one thing I, I, I realized, you know, Dennis was, you know, Mr. Europa. He's very mass market. And I also had a lot of respect for Zook, the brand, and, and, and you know what we achieved there. And I really didn't want to do something that was going to fight against Zook um, f- for the reason that I also wanted to challenge myself. Um, and, and could I do something for a different audience, mm. but do it maybe a little bit cooler than what's usually been done, right? Yeah. And actually, I was with a... Alvin Tan from Funk just on last Friday at High House. And I remember having this conversation with him when I had left St. James to join Lo and Behold. We're a Louf, uh, Louf bar. Yeah. And Alvin said to me, you wanted to challenge yourself. That's why you joined St. James. I said, <laughs> I said, yeah, how did you know that? He goes, and, and Alvin, Funk had done a lot of stuff with Zook during, during my time. So he, he knew me well enough that I was always trying to push certain things, right? So with St. James, um, for example, you know, at the time, there's definitely going to, be, going to be a Chinese club, right? Yep. And Canto Pop was the thing then. So I said to Dennis, I said, Dennis, why don't we do Mando Pop? Why do yeah. Canto Pop? Yeah. I mean, Taiwan is big now. Shanghai, Beijing is big. They don't speak Cantonese there. Why yeah. don't we do Mando Pop? Not Canto Pop. Canto Pop is so... 1980s, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he goes, oh, a good idea. <laughs> so we did that. And then I remember doing the, ident- the, the brand identity for Dragonfly, which is the name of the club. Mm. I said, let's use more minimalist Japanese style graphics and art direction. So yeah. again, I was looking at ways to present the, the ID and the graphics and the art direction so that it would not be seen as Abeng. 
yeah. but seen as something, wow, that's really cool. Right, right. You know, and using that Japanese influence from a, from a, from a graphic design art direction point of view, right? Mm. And then, then he wanted to do a, a room that was going to have an acoustic band mm. playing acoustic favorites mm. like Bloody Eagles, Hotel California, all that shit. No, 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 no. I said, what about jazz? He goes, oh no, jazz doesn't make money. People will get one glass of wine and they, that's all they do for, for jazz. I said, that's true, okay. What about if we do swing jazz, big band? Mm. And I said to him, and I played him a Michael Bublé CD. I said, listen to this. Mm. Oh, this is quite good. I said, yeah, this is swing jazz. Mm. Would this work? Yeah. And then he, he, he said, yeah, let's do it. And he gave me permission. So you were like, ID marketing? No, 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 no. I just, just, I just had the idea. And then we, got, we had other people do the design, right? But, but right. then when it came to, this, to the band, at, and this is called the Bellini Room, yeah. the Swing Jazz Room, I said, we should have a brass section. So he gave me permission to have the band. It was a small Damn. room, but we had four brass section. We had tenor sax, alto sax, trumpet, and trombone. Uh -huh. Drummer, baby grand, double bass, and uh, lead guitar. And wow. two or three singers. That was an expensive room, man. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. But again, it was something that we created, and um, I wouldn't say we made a lot of money in that room, but you know, at least we were Fine. able to. We had yeah, create something, right? Yeah. But again, you look at the whole in totality, right? The whole room, all the rooms. You have some rooms to make a lot more money, and other rooms maybe not. But the other rooms give you a bit more of an edge or a niche, right? So cool you, hangout spot. Yeah. So it gives you the different options, right? And that was the whole idea. We had. 10 uh, Nine outlets set, right? yeah, in, under one roof. So you could move around the whole time, right? We had, um, what else did we have? We had uh, a world music bar, but in the end I realized that world music is not gonna work for this crowd and we went world more Latin, right? right? So Latin pop, right? So that was more Vida. And then we had Powerhouse, which started off a bit more R&B, uh, but that was the time when Usher was starting to dabble into this whole EDM thing, David Guetta. Electronic pop. Yeah, and then the whole Black Eyed Peas, and, yeah. and suddenly that whole, uh, all these American R&B artists was getting a house beat to their music, and EDM had started, to, you know, David Guetta was starting to pick up, and that was that the whole- crossover. Yeah, and you know when the first few years that we, that Powerhouse was open, right? Uh, I remember when Zuka would happen that night, mm. We we're quite worried because our crowd would go to Zucat, right? Oh, yeah. But towards the end of my time at St. James, on Zucat night, I had a big queue. Yeah. So basically, we had created our own identity with our own crowd who, who don't want to go to the bloody beach and listen to whoever they listen to, right? Yeah. So it was, it was great. Again, patience, focus on that. Yeah. But what, what really surprised me was that, and we had found that sound, and in, in a way, it was, was the sort of early days of EDM. That became our sound, the R&B, hip hop, you know, that really early days of EDM. Mm. And um, what surprised me was, eventually that's what Zoot was playing, but I didn't expect that. I thought this is our identity, this is who we are. The more commercial. Yeah, yeah. and then Zoot will have its thing. Yeah. But I didn't realize that Zoot had actually taken on this as well. Yeah. Uh, which I thought, well, that's kind of, mm, okay, anyway. Yeah. 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 But like I said, I mean, like I said, if you don't know, uh, maybe you, you sometimes you can't fight the, the trends you yeah. know, you, you, or, or you basically have what, restart, reset, maybe that can't work, right? You can't, you can't do that, right? Like what you say, like a lot of external forces at work. Exactly, yeah, exactly. You so, can't really predict. Yeah. Um, I think you are huge on this servant leadership role. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've learned this in Army. I'm also like creating this company, leading by servant leadership. But um, what does that exactly entail? Um, you know, do you have to like uh, do the work rather than tell them to do it? Oh, no, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah. Servant leadership is just understanding the needs of the people that work for you. Mm -hmm. um, what's important to them? Right. Uh, give them the tools to help. Yeah, give them the tools to do what they want to do. Uh, reward them for the things that they like to be rewarded for or, 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 and reward them in a way that they appreciate. You know, like some people... And that's what I mean. You have to have you have to have that knowledge of your people, and sometimes it's about uh, do they want public recognition? Do they want private recognition? Do they want more salary? Mm. Do they want 
uh, more training? Do they want to get promoted? Uh, yeah. Do they want more time with their family? Do they want to uh, learn more about certain things? You know, it, it, it's all about understanding your people and what. There's no one size fits all, right? It's one yeah. size fits one, and, and people. And as a leader, we have to be trying our best to understand. And that's the hardest part. Is, is that your company gets bigger and you're trying to appease everybody? Yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, I, I find that even to, to, I mean, today I was having a discussion with my HR manager. And, about stuff and it's, it's very hard to keep everyone happy uh, yeah so you, you, so you have to look at things at a very high level and look at things in a very logical and and, and purposeful way you know when I say purposeful like having is it the vision of the company is it the purpose of what we're trying to do my own personal values of what I want and can we that help guide me to why we make certain decisions because you can't as much as they say yeah I'll listen to everyone what they want but you can't still can't keep everybody happy, right? Yeah, because majority it's, it's, wins. It's not always, not always, not always so, right? Not always, and yeah. and I think it's about looking at things that um, like ethics, ethics. Uh, again, being adaptable, uh, giving people options, pe- opening people's mind to things that maybe they didn't think about. You know, a couple of years ago, right. because if you give them options that they never thought about, they're like, oh. Right. Oh, this is interesting. Maybe I would like this. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Don't don't get stuck in your ways all the time. Don't feel like this is the only way, the only path forward. There's many paths forward, right? You just mm. be flexible enough to be able to, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, choose the one that's relevant at that time. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So after um, Powerhouse and James Powerhouse, you moved to uh, the Low and Behold Group. So uh, I've vaguely heard about. Um, that organization, but um, I don't really know a lot about it. So, could you like maybe like summarize like? I would say that what is it like a property prop- group? No, no, the the the, the probably the premier restaurant group in Singapore. Um, mm. The very clear vision of what they want to do. Yeah. Um, all their recent projects have been very successful. Their, their marketing and branding is very very strong. Yeah. Um, they have clear. They know exactly what they're, they're targeting in terms of their, their audience, their their positioning, um, what they're trying to achieve, and they've, you know that their first outlet was Loof, uh, yeah. uh, just nearby here, and um, and after that they had Over Easy, White Rabbit, which is now Claudine, uh, Tanjong mm. Beach Club. Mm. Um, you have Esoro, the Japanese restaurant, you have the Warehouse Hotel. Oh, um, and uh, Coconut Club, and what else? Uh, clothing Fico, which is an Italian restaurant at East Coast. Yep. So they they got a lot of stuff going on, and uh, they've done very well. Um, and uh, yeah, I yeah. think uh, Tanjong Beach Club has a very strong, like, uh, control over that that uh, beach club market, and then after that. Rumors Beach Club come, starts to uh, you know come up. Did it kind of like negatively impact it in a way? Did that competition make it like uh, more challenging? No, I think or Tanjum, they you know they have Tanjum their strong Be- fan yeah, base. Yeah, Tanjung Beach Club has a very strong fan base. Um, right, and uh, it's like you said just now about trust with Zook, right? It's the same. Yeah. Uh, lo and behold, outlets yeah. have a lot of trust with their audience. You know, people yeah. trust that they, what they're going to deliver is something that is is fits into their lifestyle and I think they've done very well that way. Yeah. yeah. So it's like when you look at the two beach club, right? It's like one is the red umbrella, one is the yellow umbrella. <laughs> you can kind of tell. Yeah. But yeah, so... Yeah, it's very... Uh, but I think it's... Uh, is it beach club? Is it more like kind of like expat lifestyle kind of... Uh, from what I've heard, I haven't yeah. been I haven't been to Tanjong Beach Club since I left the company. But from what I've been hearing from my ex colleagues, that mm. a lot of the North Asians, mm. like the Chinese, the the Koreans who live in Singapore, they're going to beach clubs now. Mm. So it's no longer just a, it's like a shifting trend. Huh? Yeah, no, I, I think I think um, everything everything's global. It's it's no no longer about oh, it's more of a Caucasian thing or an Asian thing. Is I think it's. Hey, look at look at who are the biggest fans of BTS, man. It's bloody Caucasians, man. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy, yeah. right? It's like yeah. there's no there's no um, rule anymore. It's mm. it's free for everybody, you know. Mm. 
K-pop is big in the West. That if you told me that ten years ago, I was I would have laughed in your face. But look at it now. <laughs> look at it now. It's crazy, right? Um, you yeah. know, and, and, and you know, if someone told you that a Korean movie would win an Oscar, yeah. No one would believe you. Look at yeah. it now. So, it's, so all I'm trying to say is that everything's opened up. It's yeah. a lot more open-minded. Uh, people are influenced by many different things. Mm. And it's no longer about, oh, this is more of an expat thing or this is more of an Asian thing or whatever. I don't think that's, that's relevant as it was, say, 10 years ago. Now it's very open. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, I think till recently, I feel like uh, the East has always been taking inspiration from the West and um, I, I feel like to, a, to, to the point where there's like some low-key reverence like um, there'll be like Asian people like low-key like revering you know the, the West to the point of they're like copying everything that they do the way that they act the mannerisms and everything you know so um, you know in, even in the DJ book, booking market right we are always trying to introduce new music but most of the time we are always uh, booking Caucasian DJs over, yeah, rather than like, um, here's a new uh, Philippine DJ or a new Korean DJ to uh, okay. influence I, the I, sound. I, I, think, I think it's about, yeah. again, during the, the Jack Kim days with Lincoln and giving, giving the cup launch to do it. Mm. I, if it's done correctly, yeah. it can work right. for the Asian DJs. Um, but you have to build it up and you have to put money behind it. For example, um, I remember booking all these foreign DJs from Europe and America, whatever, right? And, yeah. um, and because we were starting the book a lot, we, we changed the way we designed our flyers and we would put the name of the foreign DJ there and, then they, and we wanted to put, we said, oh, let's, let's put the name of the warm-up DJ who's a resident. We should, Recognize yeah. them as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, why not? So we put the name there, and then Lincoln will go like, "Oh, can you maybe make the foreign DJ name bigger?" I said, "No, same size." <laughs> well, maybe bold it. So no, 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 same size. If you bold the foreigner, you bold the local. Equal billing is what you want to do, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I had a big argument with Lincoln about that, and <laughs> in the end, I said, "He go, okay, fine, fine, let's do it." And and what I was trying to do was. And we, I, remember, I remember we did this little booklet and we did a very expensive photo shoot of all the six resident DJs of Zook in a very cool fashion, cyber look. And um, we basically wanted to promote the resident DJs as being as good as a lot the of the yeah. yeah. And so having them equal billing was, was an important thing. Yeah. Um, and then... I remember we were doing a lot of stuff with the techno scene of, at the time and, and uh, we were just pushing our resident DJs and it will only work if you, bring, if you book certain DJs to play from overseas here. Mm. They will only work if the residents are already playing that style of music to prepare these people. Now, yeah. I, I'm sure you know this, that you've booked DJs that come from overseas, come here and play and they're a big name, but they didn't work because no one in the team is playing that style of music. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, so what we try to do was we would try to reinforce whoever we're booking comes, but the residents are playing that style already. So that gives you two things. One is that when the foreigner comes, the locals are ready for what they're going to play. Right. And have a great response. But more importantly, it would show that the residents I really know, not just know, but yeah. uh, as good as the finals. Oh. So you want to compare? Yeah, compare, compare. Mm. Actually, yeah. Sometimes the resin better than the foreigner. Oh, whoa, you finally see that, right? <laughs> so, but that's, yeah. that's to me is, is what I call, it, it's, a, it's a strategy. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's marketing. Yeah. It's because the into, foreigners really have a big team yeah, behind them, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Hear, I hear stories now, like, for example, when you have a, a big name playing at Marquee, for example, right? Yeah. Uh, who's playing maybe a bit more techno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they play at Marquee, they don't play techno. They tone it down because Marquee is not known as the techno place. Yeah. But oh. you book the name because it's a big name, but yeah. they're, they're a techno DJ. Yeah. Play at Marquee, your residents aren't playing this style of music. Yeah. 
So, and people tell me, oh, the DJ, yeah, you could tell after uh, half an hour they were... Switch it up. Yeah. Now, that's fine. Yeah. But all I'm trying to say is that it'd be better if you were to book DJs that reflect what your residents are playing. Mm. So it reinforces each other. Yeah. Rather than you book a name because why it can sell tickets for you. It can yeah. sell it can sell you champagne trains, whatever, right? It feels not the the connection is not very genuine. No, it's not. Yeah. That's the thing, right? And yeah. I've seen it a couple of times at Marquee, I feel like, oh man, this is not the way it should be because but you keep booking DJs that are big names, yeah, they'll sell tickets, but the people have no idea what the music they're playing and then when they play it, it's like, oh no one's uh, I'm going to need to change it now. I'm going to change it now. And, <laughs> but that's what we did in, in, in Jack Kim and Jay. It would like reinforce, the resident will reinforce the foreigners and the foreigners will actually reinforce what the residents are doing. Yeah. And then that just builds the pie. It builds the pie to be bigger. And then when you book other DJs that come, no problem because we already got the audience. We've got the fans already. Like warmed up. Yeah. You know, yeah. Every week. Yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, another interesting phenomenon is this thing called Siam Tiu. I'm not sure if you have you heard of this, like Thai disco. I've never been to one. No one believes this, but I've never been to one. Anyway, yeah, I, I, I've, I've never been one time. I've never hung a flower, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, it seems like they are taking over, like everywhere. Like so many clubs closed down to become a, a Siam Tiu. Yeah, is it because of their I don't know, like business strategy or, or pricing? I think the girls got a lot to do with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the commercial nature of the music also. Yeah, right. that's why it's like no, nobody even dare to do cool stuff anymore. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I mean, during, during the 90s, there were clubs like that in Singapore, but we, the, the music, at that time, the music was called Eurotrance, right? Uh, uh, Euro, Euro dance, right? Euro dance, Euro, Euro trance as yeah. well. It was very, very... Uh, Cascada. Yeah, cheesy, uh, obvious uh, beats and everything. And uh, yeah, I mean... Oh yeah, but Zooks still happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I guess, again, when there's a will, there's a way. Mm. Yeah. So maybe we can talk a little bit about High House. Yeah, quite quite excited. The first time I was there, I was like blown away. I was like, wow, wow, wow. You know, everything looks perfect. And um, before this, it was like ultimate. And it was like a typical EDM club style. But right now, you guys are also taking a more riskier route by making High House a 100% house establishment. House By house means like all styles of yeah, house, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um... A few reasons for that. I think, um, I mean, we're not a club, right? So we're an ultra lounge, we have a restaurant, you know, so, and we don't really have a dance floor. So I think when you don't have a dance floor, the pressure is off the DJ to make people dance. Mm. People will dance wherever they are, at the bar, at the table. And um, so, and when we were designing this space, we, we talked about, the food, so we have amazing food. We have great cocktails, great wine program. Yeah, um, we invest a lot in art, as you can see in the whole space, a lot of art there. And I said we should maybe have a music identity, so that we are not comparing to those other places where there's no music identity. Mm. Let's have a music identity. Now, you can say that the smaller clubs out there have a music identity because they're more underground, but they're a lot smaller. Mm. Fair, they're, they're doing a great job. You know, you're. you're your tough clubs, your HQ, your uh, th those sort of places, fantastic. They're doing a great job. Mm. Then you have the big clubs that have to be a bit more commercial because you have to sell more tickets. Yeah. So we're somewhere in the middle mm -mm. where we don't have dance floor pressure. We do food and beverage, maybe a slightly older audience, you know, like, you know, someone say older, maybe like, you know, 25 and above. And so musically, can we come up with something that is somewhere between the big room commercial clubs and the smaller underground purist clubs. Yeah. So can we play techno at High House? Probably not. But we could do trance. We could do new disco. Mm. Techno a little bit too deep. Too deep. Yeah. Nothing too deep. Right? Like you eating your yeah. steak halfway so, 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 so the underground <laughs> clubs do the deep, deeper stuff, right? Yeah. And the commercial clubs do the friendlier commercial stuff. So. Yeah. We, we want to be somewhere in the middle where it has a certain identity that you can carve out yeah. and have a point of view. Yeah. 
Yeah. So right now, um, I think the focus that you are, uh, the focus music group is like disco kind of sound, right? Not or, really. Um, disco, house, well. trance. Yeah. Trance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, Melodic trance is what we're into as what well. What are the days that uh, you have DJs? Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday at the moment. Um, and then, of course, when Nova opens, that's going to be another thing. And, and, and honestly, Nova will be a bit more commercial than High House mm. because it's very, you know, it's the open air, you'll get more yeah. tourists. We open seven days a week, so we'll slightly be a bit more commercial there. So, High House is level 61, Nova is 62. No, no, Nova is a rooftop. Rooftop. Yeah. High okay. House is 61, 62. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Nova, is it a little bit more like. Uh, like a rooftop EDM concept, would I? Can I say I, that? I, I wouldn't. I don't think we'll touch EDM, but will we be a lot more friendlier than say what we're doing in high house? That's what I said. But I don't think we'll touch EDM. Though. Right, right, right. Yeah. But it's still within that house trance. Yeah. Kind yeah. of like Melod space. melodic, melodic trance, melodic techno, that sort of stuff. You know. And anyways, you also um, did like some coaching for Republic Poly, you know. Uh, yeah, I do a lot it's of like an OUE um, scholarship program. Yeah, no, we have a lot, lot of different programs. So I, I, I believe a lot in mentoring. Yeah, I think mentoring is a, a great. I learned, I, I did a, a workshop in mentoring probably in about 2014 when I was at Lo and Behold, and I thought it was a great thing to do, and I wanted to mentor people in our company. Uh, I started to mentor other restaurants in Singapore through Restaurant Association. Mm. I started to mentor students from Shartek, um, but I also mentor other students. And uh, for me, it's like, uh, it's a two-way thing, right? Uh, the mentee obviously gets a lot out of it, but the mentor also gets a lot out of it because I get to understand how others, I learn from them. Mm. Whether you're running a restaurant or you're a student, I learn from you. Right. As much as you learn from me, I'll learn from you. So. It's, it's a great way of uh, just having another point of view in, in your mix, right? So um, I guess it's like what you mentioned before, you know, it's like when you want to find a way to reward your employee, right? You also have to know what exactly they feel is meaningful. Yeah. Okay, that, that's not mentoring, all right? That's more probably coaching and whatever. But um, yeah. But yeah, no, it's, it's about, it's about uh, yeah, just spending that time and... And, and, and communicating, you know, I think I always say as a leader, the one thing you need to get good at is to be a good listener mm. and to ask a lot of good questions because, um, yeah, I, th I think you're, the people that report to you, direct reports, want to share things, want to say things, and it's good that you listen to them and hear what they're really trying to say to you and, you know, be, be, a, be a very, be a proactive listener, you know, yeah. like really listen with intent and not so that you're, you're thinking about what to reply to them as, as, as they're talking to you you're not listening you're like thinking how what i'm going to say back to you now no no that's not right listen pause then, reply what if like on the day itself like okay they they pour out all their thoughts to you and then you don't really have the answer do you like tell them that yeah. You know, wow, that's a lot. But maybe I answer you tomorrow when I have yeah, thought this yeah, through properly. Yeah, yeah. It's I, like a more sincere. If you come tomorrow, if you have a meeting with me, I'm writing things down all the time. Yeah. I write things down because it's how I absorb things, right? Mm. And um, yeah, sometimes people just want to vent, mm. let out things, and they're not expecting you to have a solution or anything. But if they ask you for advice, then yep. But let me come back to you let me think about it yeah you know? and and re reflection is really important I, i'm a big f believer in self-reflection you know I, I'm, I write a a journal every sunday I, I, I talk about my working week a lot of times it's because maybe i'm stressed about something instead of being stressed about it, just write it down and then the stress is gone because you've you've expressed it somewhere it's mm. captured but when you don't express it it stays in your mind you can't sleep you can't eat but once you write it down, it's like you've downloaded it. Yeah. Now I can some of those things I can't download to other people because oh, yeah, it's not yeah, yeah. it's not it's not going to work. Yeah. But downloading onto a piece of paper works for me, so uh, it helps yeah. to me to. Be I agree. Yeah. I've recently started to do it right, and the, the benefits are immediate. Yeah. And I love going back over it 
and reading what I said six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, right? So it's, mm. it's quite interesting to see how you evolve over time as well, even in the short space of time, you know, how things change and um, yeah, yeah, it's always So it's quite at your level right now, right, I believe you are doing like a multitude of stuff uh, across like so many different categories, right? Do you have like a secretary to like plan your meetings no, and no, myself, is, everything is yourself? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whoa. Because I can move things around. I, I don't. Yeah. I just. I know what can move. You know. I, I can move this one. Move this one. Okay. I, you know. Just. I don't need someone to help me with that, man. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because I. I have got an impression that you know at that level is like. Well, no. Know? Last time was when I was in St James. I did have a, a personal assistant. Yeah. Or executive assistant, but I, I was shared. It useful? I, I sh- well, I shared her with Dennis Fu. Dennis Fu. Yeah, he's old school, so he needs someone to manage his calendar. Like, okay, like, for me, <laughs> I wanted someone to help me on projects. Okay. So maybe we're, we're, we're renovating a, a new, a, one of the clubs we're renovating. So I need my assistant to go and talk to the contractors or whatever. Mm-mm. Instead of me going to do it, okay, you, you go and do it. You know what I want, go and do it. So yeah. it's delegating work to someone that f- all my other managers, not really their job scope. So to give it to my assistant to go and do. Right. Was, was fine. So if she was more like my project manager, right. who's my assistant, rather than uh, a PA like secretary. A secretary. Yeah, I don't, I don't need that. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, people say, oh, who's going to make your restaurant bookings? I said, <laughs> I said, I got trope. I, I got trope. 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 You can. <laughs> Half the time you just like walk, show up yourself. Just, yeah, because people, yeah. I, I don't get it when, I mean, yeah, I, I've seen people with PAs and they're like, really? <laughs> What, what what this one I've heard about people who have part time PAs. I said, what, what, why to do what? Uh? Maybe if plan for your calendar. Loyal, I kind of understand. To, what to plan your calendar? You plan yeah. yourself, uh, what, what do you want? I mean, you know. Uh, oh, find a date that that I'm free. Find a date that I'm free to have a meeting with me. I said, can't you find that yourself? You know, like bloody hell, I don't know. Yeah. But I, I would like an assistant more to help me on projects rather than. Help me play my calendar or make restaurant bookings or bloody like more tangible stuff. Yeah la, right. come on la. Oh my god. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's cool, that's cool. Because like, you know, oftentimes we always think that, you know, people that are at that level already their 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 schedule is really like so much, you know. Yeah, especially when you watch like people like Gary V, you know, that kind of no, thing. No, no, so this is the this is the thing, right? It's it's time management is a really big thing and yeah. I've been teaching some of my team about blocking time. Block that time to do, not for any meetings, not for anything, just your own time. Mm. Head down, clear your stuff, you know. Like every, usually on a Saturday or Sunday, before, with the week ahead, I look for, I look at, okay, I, I, okay, oh, that's, that's a gap, block it, block it. I don't want any last minute things. When I block it means, now. Is it like a do nothing time or something like that? Y- well, it's, it's, I don't have any meetings. I don't want to have. I don't want to interact with people. I just need to have my own time. Oh. What I do with it is my own thing. Maybe it's to clear email. Maybe it's to think about something. But I just need that time to have that. But if you keep putting meetings in, when do you have time to think? When do you have yeah. time to answer emails? When do you have time to do other communication? You don't. Yeah. So it's always time management is always about being control of what it is. Yeah. Of course, if something urgent comes up, you need to. Do, of course, you you deal with it. But yeah. You always got to ask yourself, is this important now or can it wait another week? Can it wait another two weeks? Do you plan it one week in advance, your, your schedule, or you plan the day before or something like that? Um, I, no, it's, it's the calendar's there. Like, just, it's, 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 and, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, but the thing is that I have a lot of re- recurring meetings. Oh, okay. So I just set the calendar and it's repeated like every two weeks or three weeks or one month or one week. and then that, So that forms the bulk of everything, right? And then right. everything else just fits in. And if it doesn't fit in, another week, wait another week. Never. Oh. Yeah. Got space, then block. Yeah. And then you block it so that no one is like, do not disturb me time for. You is know. it like a one hour or a. Depends. Depends oh, what really you depends. want. It could be two hours, three hours, you know. Last question. So, in a world, right, where job hopping gains you the most career progression, I, I mean, maybe now, now more than ever, right? So, uh, you personally don't really believe in this. So, why? And, yeah. I don't necessarily say I don't believe in it. It's just that for my career, it hasn't been that way. Mm. Um, was it by choice, by design, or by luck? Mm. Uh, probably more just the way it was. I, I didn't... Um, 
I think... Uh, was it because you every job you selected was very intentional? That's why yep. you can stay for 10 years? Yep, you could say that. Um, very intentional and... Um, and if you wanted to affect change, you know it would take some time, right? Yeah. Um, and if you don't want to affect change, then... Okay, so everyone has their own motivation for each job, right? You can yep. go through. Maybe for me, it was about affecting change in, yeah. in each role I had. And, um, and knowing that it would take some time to do it. So if I was prepared to be patient and wait it out and do that to affect change, then I'll do it. So, mm. But was I ever unhappy you know after one or two years and wanted to start looking around i don't know i don't i don't think so but and maybe i was just i'm just been very very lucky in my career to have found you know good employers mm. who gave me a platform to do what i had to do and um, allowed me to enjoy my work and you know uh, so maybe I'm, i've been very lucky in that way you know i, I um yeah, so maybe that's why I haven't jumped hop. Mm. But I can see why people do it now. I, I know what they're trying to do. They want to get more challenges. They want to grow faster and everything. And, um, and that, that's kind of what works in this day and age. And, yeah. Um, would that have worked in my day and age? Possibly as well, you know, because you, you always have this thing where, yeah, you've got to have at least two years on that job before you quit. You can't, you can't, be, <laughs> you can't be under two years or can't be under one year. Otherwise, you yeah. know, they see you as, uh, you know... So, but for me, I, I, ne I never thought about things like that. And, and actually, people ask me, you know, did I have a grand plan? I said, you know what? I never did. I was never a planner in that way. I had no idea. Yeah, I planned to leave Zook after the 10th anniversary. Yeah, that was a six month ahead, or well, actually, six <laughs> month ahead plan. But other than that, I have no plans whatsoever. Mm. My life has been. I don't know, I've just gone with the flow and when opportunity comes, you sort of feel like, oh, this opportunity is interesting. Maybe it's time to take that one mm. and move on, right? And actually for me, in my whole career, every job I've had in Singapore at least, mm. the, the, the time to actually move and look for a new job was quite a long period of time. It wasn't something where like that I wanted to yeah well no I'm not saying it could be a one or two year situation mm -hmm. um, for example at lo and behold I met the bosses of lo and behold about two years before I joined them oh so it was like a two-year courtship if you want to call it that right. before I joined uh, with Lincoln it was like a one year before I joined right, right. so so it's 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 not something that you do or you don't decide immediately. Okay, tomorrow I'm going to go work for someone. Else. No, no, <laughs> but it, it's it's a long uh, thing for me, and that's I've been comfortable with that mm. process. Uh, it's not for everyone, of course, but that's my I'm comfortable with that process because I get to know the people that I'm going to work with, and I realize, okay, I think I can work with these people. Yeah. Mm. What, what what you don't want to do is first day in the job, like, oh my god, these people are terrible. I don't want to work with them. <laughs> right? So what I usually do is I actually get, get to know the people before I actually join them. Yeah. You know, I'm getting to know them and, and oh, it's okay, okay. Yeah, so. so how do you retain top talent? Um, well, what we said earlier about listening to them, mm. understanding their needs, mm. what's important to them, what makes them tick, what motivates them, what engages them, and hopefully be able to design a, an employee experience that addresses that. Mm. That's, that's, what, that's what I think, yeah. So that they won't job hop. Yeah, yeah. but like I said, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, right? Yeah. And ultimately, it's sometimes, it's not about whether the people will leave you, but whether the circumstance you have created will attract others to come mm. and fill up the gap. And I'm, I'm always a you know, glass half full sort of person and you know, when people that you, who you thought would never leave you, leave you, you go like, oh, you get disappointed. But you know what? Maybe the new person joining may be better than that person. And you just got, just got to look on the bright side of things, right? And, yeah. and you know, how, how, how things are and, and move forward. Like, don't, don't do on the past too much and, yeah. oh, this person left and I put so much effort into this person, now they're leaving, or oh, why, why? Have but, you have someone that left, then, then they come back, hey, Andrew, I'd rather be working for you. <laughs> Yeah, I get, we get a lot of that. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa. I mean, no, it's just, it just, but you know, life is like that, right? We just have to move on and try new things and yeah. um, 
they realize what you want. Yeah, and then sometimes the people say they, they prefer working for you. Maybe they don't really mean it, but they just like the, that time of when they were working for you. There's that certain period of... Reminiscing the good old times. Perhaps, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and now maybe they're better because they've left and done new things and right. taken on new challenges. Yeah. And you have people that do that and they, and they actually come back mm. because, but they had to get out right. to be challenged and then they come back to the, to the same job. But they're, they're, you can see that they've grown from that. Yeah. So it's all about growth, right? And, mm. and, and sometimes it's about evolving and uh, growing. And um, yeah, so if you're not growing, you're not evolving, you're not developing, then maybe it's time to move on because unless you're happy not to, you know, I you know have a lot of people in my company now who are close to retirement age yeah. you know, at a certain level, and they are happy to not work OT, happy not to go for training, yeah. because they just want to spend more time with their grandchildren. They're looking forward to retirement. Yeah, don't pressure them on too many things. It, but they'll do their job. They'll be on time, no problem. But don't ask them to do more than that because. They're, they're not not in their frame of mind. Yeah, it's yeah. not their motivation anymore, and you got to respect that. You know, yeah. you got to respect that. So yeah, yeah, different stage of life. Exactly, yeah. exactly. All right, thank you so much for speaking to us at our podcast. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah.